Hey, good morning. Welcome to the service this morning. We are glad you are here. Another day the Lord has made. Another day for us to rejoice and be glad. Amen. We hope you feel welcome here today. And let's uh, begin our service. We're going to sing from the hymnal this morning, number 79 in your hymnal. If you want to pull that out or if you want to follow along up here, that's fine too. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every Believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes, the moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come. To the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great of rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher. Our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has. Father, we thank you for this morning, we praise you for this morning, and Lord Jesus, we ask you to bless this morning and this week, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may be seated. Well, announcements for this week are VBS, VBS, and VBS. If, uh, woohoo, say, come on, come on, get excited. All right, now, if you guys can cue up that video... I got a, I don't know if I'll, we have, uh, we have a few kids in here. Now I'm pulling an audible here, and I know I just made the half of the congregation very nervous, including Greg. Um, but if after the service, this is what I hear, this is what I hear, and you know I'm being playful, but there might be, first of all, I want the kids of you that, the, you kids that are here, I want you to see what the jungle looks like just to get ready. Don't touch anything, though. You get Pastor Sam in trouble. You just take a little look at the jungle. No touching, okay? All right? I'm trying to be careful here. Sorry, Robin. I might be making you nervous, but just no touching, and you just might see a gorilla. That's all I'm saying. So after the service, you give it about five minutes. Five minutes, parents. Everybody go see the jungle, and just wait. You might see a gorilla and you get a little preview of VBS. If, uh, if, uh, if Greg's around, maybe he can come with us and help us look for the gorilla, okay? So let's, let's see. I'm not guaranteeing anything, but I'm just saying. So after the service, give it about five minutes. Go see the jungle, no touching. 
and you just might possibly see a gorilla. That's all. If you do, let me know. Okay? All right. And with that said, door hangers, please. Um, we, we got 300 of these. I don't know how many we have left. We're, we're dwindling down. Please, it's not too late. In fact, the whole week is not too late. Take as many of these as you'll hand out. Put these on your neighbor's door. Um, please, let's get all these out. They're out front, and there's other advertisements there. So with that said, let's, uh, let's watch this advertisement for VBS. It's a jungle out there. Every day, our kids encounter questions about their faith. Did God create everything? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I really trust the Bible? At the Great Jungle Journey, kids will explore the answers to these questions and more as they embark on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. As your children sail along on a fun jungle cruise, they'll stop at seven ports of call, the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, and consummation. Kids will discover how these events shape our world, and they will realize their need for a savior as they reconnect the Bible to their everyday lives. Prepare to swing into fun on the Great Jungle Journey. All right. Okay. So after service, about give it a five minutes, go to the jungle and see what you see. But for now, say hi to your neighbor. When you hear the music, come back up. Redeemed now I love to proclaim it Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed through His infinite mercy His child and forever I am Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed His child and forever I am Redeemed and so happy in Jesus No language my rapture can tell I know that the light of His presence With me doth continually dwell Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the 
redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty. The King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. That's what you are today. Jesus paid it all. And he paid it all at Calvary. We're going to sing that one next. It's in the hymnal, page 313. If you want to break open the green book, that's okay. It's all right. We do a mix here. We're going to do some hymns today. At Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. And there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I'd learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I give him to Jesus. Whoa. Verse 4. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. And then my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Sorry about that. I lost my way there. Sorry about that. It's okay. It happens. Worship leaders. Got to put up with them. Um, we have a scripture reading today. And it's found in the book of Hebrews. And I want to read this to you and then make a quick comment on it. So starting in verse 14. There we go. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, I'm going to pause that for a minute and say it again. 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. A couple of things I want to point out here. Uh, Jesus is called the great high priest. That means he's better than anybody that came before him. Lots of high priests and back in the day, none like Jesus. And he's the son of God. If you're ever witnessing to somebody and they say, oh, the Bible never says that Jesus is the son of God. Yes, it does. Right here. You tell them Hebrews 4. Jesus, the son of God. Any questions? No. <laughs> he calls him the son of God. He's also tempted in every way. He was human. So in the same verses, he calls him the son of God and human in every way. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. All right? We can approach with confidence, boldly. I, I like this because I, I think of in the olden days when you, had a, when you had an audience with the king. Think of it. Have you ever seen old movies where they get ready to go before the king and how they're nervous and how, how am I going to say this or what am I going to do? We get to go before the king of kings, everybody. And we can go boldly. We can go with confidence because of what he's done for us. Amen? It's, it's really cool to think it through. And then at the end, so it says in verse 16, let us then approach with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't know what your time of need is. I don't know what you're going through. But you know what? You can go to the king with it. Whatever it is. Because he wants you to come. He wants you to show. He wants to be able to show you grace and mercy in whatever you're going through. And here's a tip. He already knows what you're going through. Think that through. Just think about it. He wants to hear it because he loves you. That's your confidence today. He loves you. All that in those three verses. Pretty cool, huh? All right. And with that, we're going to sing our last hymn, which is on page 383, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount of port, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace, God's grace Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide Whiter than snow you may be today Grace, grace, God's grace 
Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe all who are longing to see his face will you this moment his grace receive grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for being our high priest. Thank you for the perfect sacrifice that you made. Thank you for all that you do for us on a daily basis. Lord, we don't deserve any of it, and we are certainly grateful for all of it. Bless now the rest of the service. We offer it right back up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good singing this morning. You may be seated. Okay, thank you all very much. Okay, children, it's time for children's ministries. And don't forget, after the service in the fellowship hall, go see the jungle and you might just see a gorilla and maybe a parrot too. So we're looking forward to having you. And to everybody else, welcome again. Uh, Bonnie and I had a, a road trip uh, the past couple days. Uh, her, her grandma, who was 88, uh, had, has died, so uh, we went to uh, her funeral to celebrate her life and be with the family, and um, thank you all that have, you know, sincerely thank you for those of you that have been praying for that, and um, it was a great trip. We had a great time. The baby was really good. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it's a six-hour drive, so for, for six hours in the car, I'd say she was really good. The, the, the way down, the first half of the trip, she was good. She got a little cranky the second half. You can't really blame her. And then yesterday, she was really good. But we got home late and a lot of travel. So Bonnie and the baby are resting. But we had a good weekend, and it's, it's good to be back and good to be back in the pulpit. We are going to... Um, Instead of going to a psalm this morning, I'm going to read something to you from Matthew before we pray, and it's connected to the message that we'll be, we'll, we will have today as well. But uh, let me just read you from Matthew uh, chapter 18, and I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, "'Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven?' Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you that you sent your son to rescue us from sin, Satan, the world. Thank you for the love that your son showed us in the cross. Thank you for that, that message of peace and reconcilia reconciliation for the world. Father, we praise you. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your mercy. And if there are any here that have not yet received your forgiveness, 
through your son, I pray that they would today. Lord, we lift up this week to you. We lift up Vacation Bible School. We pray that your Holy Spirit is with us. And Jesus, that you are Lord of the whole event. Keep the enemy away from our hearts and minds and uh, help us to not be in the flesh but in the spirit. I pray for unity and great fellowship and great blessing for all uh, who, are, who are ministering in this. I pray for a wonderful time. I thank you for the brothers and sisters in Jesus from Forest View. And I pray a special blessing on them for helping us. I pray that all aspects of the VBS, from the music to the message to the uh, crafts and snacks and games and every component, I pray everything goes smooth. But most of all, that Christ Jesus is honored and his gospel is preached and that kids and adults are saved. Lord, I, I pray for the neighborhood outreach, that uh, the door hangers that have been left, and I pray for many more to be left, that it makes an impression on people, that, it'll, that it will bring some to VBS. I pray we hear that some came because of the door hangers, but even for those that don't, that their curiosity would be, um, their curiosity will get, will, will get to them and they'll, they'll check out the church, they'll see what we're about, they'll see the gospel, on our website, and maybe they'll even come and ask questions. And I do pray that you use that, God. Lord, there are other prayer requests this morning. First of all, there are so many that, that won't be mentioned, um, be it that it's just, it's just something that didn't come to mind, or be it something that's not known. Lord, you know what those requests are, and I ask for your grace to intervene in those situations. I pray for Mike and Lisa Nelson, um, uh, Mike's niece, Sherry. I pray that they find her. I pray that she's safe. I pray that she knows you as her Savior. I pray for Jim Pirinelli and his back. I ask you to give him relief, give him strength for this week. Uh, especially with VBS coming up, Lord, give him a special endurance. And uh, be with Cheryl, too, as she uh, tries to encourage him and and also we'll have many things to do. So encourage them this week, Lord. Also, for Terry, Brother Terry Knaus and his, uh, his health issues, uh, Lord, I pray that you'd give him strength and endurance this week, and we thank you for all he's doing. I pray for all the VBS workers again, Lord, um, for health and strength. Lord, we ask you for uh, Brianne Copeland and, and the three children she's fostering, for your grace and guidance to them in that situation and blessing on those kids, that all those kids would know you as their Savior. We pray for Judy's sister, Carol Klein, who has cancer in the brain. Uh, Lord, we ask you that this new treatment would work. Be with her, Lord. Please be with her. Be with Elsina, too, Barb Tiarella's cousin. Um, uh, there's, there, there was test results for suspected lung cancer they're waiting for. Um, and I, uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, the results are negative. And I do ask you that Elsina would be cancer-free, but keep her close to you, Lord. Be with the Messer family at this time. Be with Ellen and Eileen. Also be with Linda Atwater, um, who fell and is at, is at home right now. Lord Jesus, be with her in every way. Um, Charlotte Garvin needs to have... Um, a, bi a biopsy for a lymph node, and we pray for negative results. Please be with her and Ron. Encourage them today. Lord, I pray for Bonnie's family as they're mourning the loss of um, Grandma May. Uh, I just pray for your comfort and grace to them. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we could get together and remember her life and her wonderful impact on her family. I pray for them all, Lord. I pray for Kathy and Jim and Tracy and Lowell and all the family members, Lord. And I pray for, for Grandpa Bob, her husband. This is the second, second wife that he's lost. He, he's, he's been blessed to have two marriages, and the one uh, first wife died from cancer, and then he was married to May for 17 years. And um, what a blessing, but also very hard. So I pray you encourage him, Lord. 
I thank you for him. I thank you for his love for you and his, his wanting people to know the gospel. And um, I just pray you be with him and keep him close to you, Lord. We ask continued healing, Lord, for so many, for Jeff Baxter, for Dominic and Marilyn Bellata, John and Janine Golba, Pat and Lorelai Licata, Ron Logan, Eileen McLaren, Eric and Beverly Marzell. We do miss seeing them here, Lord. Please encourage them today. Mike Nelson, Cindy Newman, Angie Phillips, Eric and Jamie Pizella, Rena Charlu, Richard Schwegler, Chris Schaefer, John and Karen Thaler, Marcy Teal, Tim Kay, uh, Robin Wino's uh, sister-in-law, Diana, uh, Sherry Cudahy's sister, Dorothy, Liam, and Travis. Um, Lord, we pray for your grace. And uh, Ed and Mary had given a new request this morning about a family friend named Todd, who's, uh, if I recall right, got in an accident, uh, had collapsed lungs, broken ribs. We ask healing for Todd, and most importantly, we ask for salvation. Lord, we ask for a blessing on David and Beth Larson today, a blessing on their, their family, and Jesus be with them and help them to reach many international students with the gospel. Encourage them, Lord, and please be with them today. Lord God, we pray for our country, we pray for our leaders, we pray for those in the White House, excuse me, White House, we pray for those uh, in state government, we pray for those in local government, Lord, that you would sustain the stability of our society in your grace, that you would put an end to the evils in our society, such as uh, the killing of the unborn, and Lord, that you would save those in leadership from, from uh, governors, Kathy Hochul to uh, local town supervisors such as Steve Broderick. Um, Lord, we pray that they all know you. We pray that you draw them to yourself. And it'll be one, it would be just very encouraging to hear of leaders coming to you. So help us to faithfully pray for this, Lord, even throughout the week, uh, that you would have mercy on our leaders and on our country and give Give, give those of us in the pulpit the wisdom to know how to address the issues of our day and to give insight from God's word. Give all of us that wisdom, dear Lord. Lord, I ask you to be with us in Jesus' name and to bless our time in your word and bless our time in communion. Bless the offering and bless this week of VBS. As the children come and we minister to them, in Christ Jesus' name, amen. All right, the men are going to come up and take the offering. And now you can turn to Matthew 19. And we'll look at verses 13 to 15, Matthew 19, and we'll look at verses 13 to 15. Taking a, taking a break from our, our series on who is God today, we will, Lord willing, continue that next Sunday. But today, a message on kids. So if you'll please stand for the reading of God's word, Matthew 19, 13 to 15. Then little children were brought to him that he, may, that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Father, bless our time in your holy word. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.
This is going to be a, really a very simple message, I hope, <laughs> but one we need to hear. <clears throat> it might be a little bit more of like an informal talk, a little bit of a different style, I think, but it's something that really needs to be talked about, and that's kids. Kids and the blessing that they are from God, and that our society is completely against that message. What message? The value of children. Children, by and large, in society are seen as a nuisance, even sometimes in the church, you know? And I got no issues with, with, with the children's ministries and the children's classes and what, what great work you all do, but we better not have the attitude that they're not allowed in the sanctuary. That attitude exists in some churches. It's true. I've even heard some stories about pastors getting mad because they hear kids, they can't focus. Well, too bad. I mean, would Jesus be okay with that? Do you think Jesus would understand that? Now, if, the, if your kid is, is, you know, is belching and crying and, it, you know, most moms have a good sense to, you know, take them out in the foyer, but hearing kids, hearing children, that brings life. And this is a good, good, good message for VBS. Now, I'll also take this opportunity to, to talk with you a little bit um, what happened at the Olympics. And I, 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 I hate to even think about that, but I've been hearing a lot about it, and I understand a lot more about it than I did last week. So as you know, at the beginning of the, the Olympic ceremony, there was uh, what many believe to be a mockery of the Lord's Supper, uh, particularly uh, Leonardo da Vinci's depiction of it. Now, whether you like that painting or not is not the point at all. Okay, and so you hear some people saying, well, that wasn't intended to be a mockery of the Last Supper. That was uh, a ritual of Dionysus, uh, you know, a pre-Christian pagan ritual. And it was. It was, not you've got to understand, the Bible talks about the Lord's table and the table of demons, and this is in competition. Okay, so it is still... It is still uh, an offensive statement, but here, here's what, what makes it more pertinent in regards to, um, or more, uh, more relevant in regards to actually being an attack on Christianity, because it was. This has happened before. Now, I don't know all the details, but in 1789, uh, you may be familiar with the French Revolution. And this is a time when atheists took over France. Uh, it was a violent revolution. Um, they took over the churches. They were Roman Catholic churches. But they went into the churches, and they desecrated them, and they, they put reason... They made reason the God. And in one of these Roman Catholic churches, and I think it might have actually been um, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, um, but even if it was that, it was, a, it, was a, it was a Roman Catholic church. These atheist revolutionaries who were taken over France did essentially the same thing back then. They, they reenacted uh, this, this uh, Dionysian ritual in a church. Where, in a church where, I know, I'm, I'm no, you know, there's no secret here. We don't agree with Roman Catholicism. We think their doctrine is wrong. But this is just history, what happened, to show you that it, it, the, how intentional this was on their part. In a church where the Lord's Supper is celebrated every week, albeit imperfectly and wrongly, we would say, that didn't really matter to them. Their point was to go into a church 
and to celebrate this pagan god instead of Christ. It was an intentional statement. And so this, this happened in France over 200 years ago, and it happened again at the beginning of the Olympics. So it is intentional. And I can't help but not see Satan behind it. To me, it seems like a declaration of war against God. I mean, you are, you are seeing in the time you live, you are seeing such open rebellion and challenge to God ways, in God's ways. You are seeing things we haven't seen in a while. And it's almost as if Satan is taunting God. Why would he do that? I mean, we know that's what he does. What's going on in the heavenlies? What, what kind of spiritual warfare is going on? What's coming to the earth? I make no predictions. But there's something going on. There's something going on in the heavenly and spiritual realities. Something, something I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to predict anything. But you could just, if you can't understand why they would do that, you need to look behind the people. Because apparently a lot of these folks were so surprised that there was outrage. And Christians need to speak up. They, they need to speak up. We need to defend our Lord. We need to defend His ways. And you see, when we speak up, how they back down. The Bible says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. But we have to speak up. We have to speak for truth. We have to speak for God. So we need to continue to pray there, okay? I don't know exactly what's going on, but it's, it's the significant, okay? Uh, Satan is rebelling against God. It's out in the open. And we need to keep our, our spiritual eyes and ears on alert. I mean, folks, I'm telling you, this is going a little bit off on a side, but when you see everything that is, that is going on, in the Middle East, with Israel and the nations that surround them. And again, I'm not one to make predictions. That's not my job, nor should I. And no one knows the day or hour. But the world is ripe for Antichrist. Now, I, I talk to people on all sides. Okay, I know people that are pro-Palestinian, okay? Um, and I hear it all, but what, one thing I see in common, one thing I see in common is if a world ruler was to come onto the scene and to bring peace to the Middle East, he would be able to deceive people on all sides. This is why this is so scary. And, 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 and as a believer, you're kind of, you're kind of it's kind of a, a tenuous moment because, of course, we want to see peace, right? I mean, nobody wants the world to be at war. But when you hear about peace talks in the Middle East, your spiritual discernment antenna's got to go up. Now, that doesn't mean that a political figure who brings peace to the Middle East now is the Antichrist. No, but your, your antenna's got to be going up because we know what the Bible says. And so that's my biggest concern. Yes, I'm, I, the horrible atrocities, these kids being bombed on the soccer field, terrible. These evil terrorists doing evil things. But you know, we, we live in this, this tenuous moment where 
I don't know that we're going to see the complete peace now. And if I see the complete peace, I'm getting a little nervous. And so I want to focus on praying for people's salvation and stuff like that. And of course, we don't want, you know, children being hurt and bombed, and that's terrible. But we know, we, we pray and, and, and do things to help, absolutely. But we also got to know the times we're living in. And I think, you know, think about it. Think, think about if your favorite, your favorite politician, whoever that is, was able to bring world peace. How enamored you would be with that. We have to be careful. We have to guard our hearts. I'm just telling you the reality. I don't know any other way to see it. But that, that, that's kind of a whole other conversation. But going back to, to the, you know, that pagan ritual they did at the Olympics, there was a kid there. There was a kid there. A kid around drag queens. Are you sick? Not you guys, but the people who did this. You know, I love... Uh, our brothers and sisters at Faithful Stones Church in Buffalo. And uh, they, um, they're always at the, the uh, uh, abortion clinics, and they're, they're, they're protesting, they're witnessing the people about Christ. Well, they'll go. There, there's this bookstore that does drag queen story every, every now and then. And they'll, they'll go to the bookstore. You know, it's for kids. And they'll protest and they'll witness to people. I mean, they're very respectful about it, but they're bold. And um, the last time that they went, I went with them, um, they, they closed down the event. So you see, because of the pressure from the church, that wicked event closed down. We can make a difference. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We have more authority than you think because Jesus gave it to us. You know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I get a little nervous putting a door hanger on a door. What if someone sees me? But Jesus has said, all authority on heaven and on earth is mine. What am I scared of? No one's going to shoot me. And I'm not going to get shot putting a door hanger on a door in Bronson Drive. If I do, I know you never know. And... uh well, that would be a good way to go, I guess, you know. <laughs> you know. But, you know what I'm saying? Like, the chances of that, what am I worried about? Someone's going to be, I don't like you. Mm. Well, you know, and by the way, that's never happened. Um, I mean, there's been people that, you know, haven't, you know. There's been, I don't know if I, I recall anyone ever being really, really nasty or mean. Like, you know, people that maybe weren't too about it, but, but it could happen, so there's no promises here. But I say all that to say is there is a war on the kids. You know, family is being devalued in society. As I was reading my commentary for this message, the, the commentator, I don't remember which one it was, but he was talking about the fact how in... in from certain corners of society, and I think a lot of this might come from the elites and the higher-ups and evil Hollywood, there's this impression given that family life is boring. It's drudgery. That, and they put this in quotes, being married with children is boring. It's not exciting. And I don't mean to defile your minds, but I remember that show from when I was a kid. I used to like that show. I said, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look up, I'm going to just look up the theme song. I mean, the whole show, the whole theme song is anti-family. You have Al Bundy sitting there on the couch. Like, and, you know, the wife comes down. He doesn't give her much attention. And, oh, first the kids come and he just gives them a dollar. The son comes and then the daughter comes. And the wife comes next to him and kisses him and he's just like, and it's like, what, what's, what, what's the impression of a family life? It's boring. You think about it. You think about um, so many of the shows. I'm sorry to do this to you, but 
when we watched when we were young, you know, Seinfeld, which has a lot of funny moments, to this day I remember. But the whole show was uh, very much centered around promiscuity and against family life. Don't you remember, some of you watched Seinfeld, I know it, when Kramer's like, don't get married, it's a trap, it's a trap, you can't do anything. I sound more like Jerry there than Kramer, but... And these characters were funny, there's no question about that. But it was all about promiscuity, open sex, many relationships, and don't get married. That's going to drag you down. Kids, forget it. This has been subtly implanted in our minds for years. This is the message that society has given us. And Satan... Well, for those of you that are married and have family, he will try to put in your mind, in essence, that, that this is boring, you're trapped, there's too many responsibilities. And there may be times where you feel like it is too much work. But you know what? I really believe this, that you stick it out, the reward is worth it. I have to give a very important caveat. Not everyone's married, and God's got a purpose for you too. And not all marriages work out. The point is this. You got to do your best. You got to do everything to make it work. Sometimes things don't work out in the end. I'm not giving you a rosy picture. I've seen my family, but all different sides of it. But the emphasis here is don't give in to Satan. Don't give in to Satan when he tries to attack your family life and he tries to attack the value of children. And that's a society. That's why I brought up Married with Children and all these old shows because they present children and they present married life as a drudgery. I mean, that L, that L Bundy opening, it exemplifies it and captures it perfectly. And, you know, it's got that song in the back, love and marriage, love and... But it's mocking it. It's, like, it's almost like the theme song is saying, people used to think this was a good idea, but not anymore. We have to fight. And while not everyone's married, and that's okay, God has a plan, and while not all marriages make it, we have to fight for the marriages and families we have, being faithful and, 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 and diligent to obey God's word as best we can. Yes, there are some very difficult situations, but you can't control the situation. I remember uh, one, uh, I don't know if I've told you this before, but one of my professors at school tells a story of a, a guy comes in his office, his wife just, you know, up and left him one day, and so he's, he's, he's talking to the, the counselor, the Christian counselor, the pastor, and he wants, you know, he wants his marriage back, but the, uh, the, the pastor tells him, he says, you know, I want you to understand, I can't get your wife back. He says, but what I can do is help you to be the godly man you're supposed to be. And then maybe, maybe she'll notice that and your marriage will be restored. But at least you're going to go down fighting, you know. At least you're going to go down saying, you know what, and, and for those of you, you know, that are in troubling situations and, and you're very aware of your faults, you just acknowledge that and you say, you know what, I'm going to be as faithful as I can before God. I can't control what the other person does, but I'm going to love God and I'm going to be as faithful as I can. Okay? Same thing with kids. We've got to fight for our families. We've got to fight for our kids no matter what stage we're at. And going back to this verse... I look at this in uh, Matthew 19, 
It says, then little children were brought to him. There's, there's discussion on how young these children were. Um, some, some say they were infants. Some say they were teenagers. Maybe it's in between. I tend to think they were younger, infants and younger children, but there is a little bit of discussion about that, but we're talking about young people here, possibly including infants, toddlers. Um, I mean, that, that, that seems to fit the context well, especially when you go back to just the last chapter we read in, uh, in Matthew 18, uh, verse 2, when it says, Jesus called the little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So you can see, you could see Jesus grabbing a little child and holding it in front of him. He says, unless you become like one of these, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. It says, little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. This shows a wrong attitude on the part of the disciples. The the application is this. We must never think that little children are a bother to Jesus. We must never think that our busyness and our and our, even our ministry for the kingdom is too important to include children. That's why sometimes you have that attitude. You, you do have an attitude where, that's out there where children are not welcome in the sanctuary. That's not right. We must welcome them. Again, nothing wrong with having classes and all that, but children and babies are welcome here. Jesus loved children. And what does he say in verse 14? He says, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now you look at this this word for um, permit the children to come to me. It comes from a Greek word, uh, aphete. And it can mean to permit, it can mean to send away, interestingly enough, it can mean to leave alone, it can mean to release, it can even mean to forgive. So it it really depends on the context uh, in order to discern what it means. But Jesus, I like the way that the New American Standard says it, but Jesus said, leave the children alone. Leave the children alone and do not forbid them to come to me. Now, the way the sentence reads in the original Greek is a little bit more in lines with the way the King James Bible words it. It's the same meaning, but in the King James, Jesus said, suffer little children. Again, that's that word for permit, which can mean leave alone, release. Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. So in that ordering, it says right before come to me, it says forbid them not. It's the same effect. Leave the children alone. Let them come to me. The disciples knew how, obviously they knew how busy Jesus was in his ministry. They knew how important Jesus was. And you know, if you've ever been to, uh, you know, a, a big Christian conference, or uh, some of you guys just went to Kingdom Bound, you know, you know, a lot of people want to talk to the, you know, the, the, the cast, the, the band members of the Casting Crowns, or Mercy Me, if you can, or if uh, John MacArthur's in town, or Paul Washer, as he just was. Um, everyone wants to talk to them, you know. I mean, if we, had, if we had someone of that caliber here, you can imagine there would be a line after church. You know, people want to talk. And, you know, preachers get tired. I mean, especially after a while, especially after these big conferences, hundreds and hundreds of people coming to them. They got to eat. 
And you can imagine, you know, the line's as long as it is, but these silly parents want the preacher to, to, to take a picture with their kids. And you can see, you know, the preacher's uh, travel agents or security guards, well, no, 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 pastor's got to get rest. You know what Jesus' attitude is? Leave them alone. Let them come to me. It's not as if Jesus wasn't busy, but he made time for children, and he says that heaven belongs to one like these. Now, is Jesus saying that that children, you know, automatically go to heaven? Or is he saying you have to become like a child to go to heaven? Well, the emphasis, I'll put it this way, I think there's truth to both. I really do. I really do. I think there's truth to both. But Jesus both loves and wants to be with children. And children have a pure faith. Children can have a pure faith. But he also is telling us as adults, that's the kind of faith you have to have to enter my kingdom. You have to be humble like them. You have to be trusting like them. You know, in the, I think, I think in the, the, the church today, I've noticed two wrong attitudes towards kids. The one wrong attitude is to assume that just because your kids were raised in a Christian home, that they're automatically saved. And, you know, um, because, because these, these children were, you know, raised in our home, we raised them to know and love Christ, they're, they're fine, we're never going to question that, just, we just assume that they're saved until they, you know, give obvious evidence otherwise. And I think that's a wrong approach because if you're just assuming your kids are saved... Um, Are you preaching the gospel to them? Are you explaining how to be saved? But you can make another huge mistake. I see, and I I see the opposite extreme, and that is to assume they're not saved. How do you know that? How do you know a child can't get saved at two years old? They can so it's, a, it's, a, it's an equally wrong error to assume that they're, they're, they're not saved. You have to look for fruits. You have to look for evidence. And when you see that child express faith in Christ or wanting to learn about God or wanting to pray, you encourage that. You don't know their heart. It's not your job to know their heart. Let God know their heart. You are to encourage them in the ways of God, keep preaching the gospel to them, but when they show evidence that they want to follow Jesus, you encourage that. Now, we know and understand, and there's a lot of different views on this, and it would be a a, a totally different sermon that I'm, I'm not going to be preaching today, but I believe as believers... In the unfortunate event that a child dies young, I think we can have great confidence in the mercy of God. But that is not an excuse to think that, oh, well, until they're 15, I don't have to preach the gospel to them because they're not accountable. No. Share it with them when they're two. Share it with them when they're three. So yes, God, I do believe, and I believe that anyone that's saved, including a little child, was born again by the Spirit of God. And if God knows that child's going to die young or even in the womb, he, 
you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. So if God saves infants and children, it has to be because he gives them new life. There's no neutral state, even for kids. So anyone that's saved, including little kids, is there because of the blood of Jesus. And we have different indications of Scripture on this. Um, you know, Luke chapter 1, verse 41, it tells us that Elizabeth, she's pregnant with John the Baptist, and though it says she's filled with the Holy Spirit, it says the baby leaps in her womb. You also have 1 Samuel chapter 12, 23, after David's child dies, uh, David says that, that the child's not going to come to him, but he's going to go to the child. So there's these indications here. And we trust in God's mercy in those terrible, unfortunate circumstances where a child dies young. I believe we can have confidence in God's mercy to that child. But that then does not become an excuse to say, well, I don't have to worry about preaching the gospel to them. No. Because someday they're going to be confronted with the choice if they want to follow Christ or not. And if they're going to be living a long life on this earth, it's parents' job to share Scripture with them. So, we don't assume they're just saved. We don't got to worry about it. We also don't assume they're lost and discourage them. We, when we see those signs of faith, we encourage it, but with a mindset to always be preaching the gospel and, and, and challenging that young child. And of course, at, at each age level, it's going to be different. But challenge them to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, letting them know what the gospel is. And as they get older, you could tell them more. But this is a very important message for Jesus. So yes, I think heaven is so full of children. I think if you were to see it, you would just see so many children running around and playing. I think the kingdom of heaven is full of little ones. We lost a little one in the womb, so it's very dear to us. But I do believe here the Lord also has in mind to tell us and to tell the disciples to not be so high and mighty and to become like these little ones. What do, what do little ones have? They have a simple childlike faith and trust. And that's what God calls from us. He calls us to trust him, to trust him like children. And then what does the verse say? And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. So Jesus spent time ministering to the children. Now if you go back to uh, Matthew 18, which we read earlier, when Jesus says in verse 3, he says, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So there you see him very straightforwardly saying, you need to be like a child to enter the kingdom. Well, what, what's the characteristic of children? Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. He's... The Lord's calling us to, you know, to have that, the faith of a child. We trust him. Children's should, children should trust their parents. They have a simple trust. They have a simple faith. We need to have the same. So we see not, how, we, we see not only how much Jesus loves children, but how much he wants us to be like them in regards to our faith. The disciples were with Jesus, the most important, and we know this is literally true, man in the world, the most important man that ever lived. And it was very easy for them to start thinking about their positions and their roles and their prominence in the kingdom. 
But Jesus tells them, no, you've got to become like a child. Remember, the disciples got so excited about casting out demons. He says, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's so easy for the minister or the pastor today to get excited about his ministry or his media outreach or his popularity or his YouTube podcasts, and that's all fine. But that's not primarily what the kingdom is about. The kingdom is about taking care of God's children, both spiritually, spiritual children, all of us who believe in Christ, and the young ones. And Jesus says in verse 6, now he might be talking about believers, but I, 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 I would say that I think that there is a sense in which this is a warning to anyone who would mess with a kid. Jesus says, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin... It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. When you look at the world's attitude towards children, it's awful. If you don't want them, you can kill them in the womb. The, the, the child trafficking that's going on in just the in in a, in our TV shows and in our movies, the devaluing of the family goes completely against what Jesus was about. And even the church can fall into the error of thinking that children are not important. But we have to say with Jesus, let the children come to him. VBS is one way we do that. This, this whole week, let the children come. Yes, they're going to be excited. Yes, some of them will be a little annoying. But do not forbid them. Let them come. Let them have fun. They're not polished. They don't know the COVID protocols. They don't, they don't, you know, yes, yeah, sometimes you got to calm them down. But they're kids. Can I ask a question? This is really off cuff. Why are people so hard on boys for having energy? Isn't that what boys do? <laughs> They're boys. You know, th this, is, this is the, you know, you see transgenderism, the error of it, you see it's so subtle. You know, schools act like they don't, public schools act like they don't know that boys are different from girls. Oh, you can't? They're different! So yes, sometimes we've got to calm them down, but boys have energy. They got excitement. They're going to be our future leaders. There's a certain sense you've got to encourage that. Yeah, we don't want them to hurt themselves. You know, we don't want, we don't want them, you know, trying to fight the gorilla that can't see them and might fall on them, of course. But kids have energy. And the girl, of course, the girls get excited too. This is a wonderful thing, but not just during VBS, but always, to hear giggling, laughing kids. You know, kids are more perceptive than you think. They understand more than we think that they understand. They, they can absorb stuff. We've got to let them come. We've got to let them come to Jesus and that's not just for VBS week, but that's for, for always. We don't want to become a church that is, you know, cold and stiff towards kids. We think they're bothering us. You know, if they're running, you know, running around and stuff like that. You know, there's a certain 
playfulness that we have to have even with the kids and understand where they're coming from and understand their excitement. And again, just going back to this, the disciples thought Jesus was too important. He said, no, let them come. And he tells them that in fact, that anyone that wants to come into his kingdom has to have that humble attitude. And that's what salvation is about. And that is what our Lord here in Matthew 18 um, brings forth for us so clearly in verse 3 that we, we don't get saved by figuring it out. We don't get saved by figuring out every intellectual question, figuring out every doctrine, solving every controversy, having 100% evidence and proof in our head at all times. And there is a place for growing in our understanding and there is is certainly a place for looking at the veracity and the proof of the Christian faith which is there. But you don't get saved by convincing yourself intellectually with childlike humbleness you realize you need God. And you just tell God you need Him. But you can't have God if you don't have His Son. Because you are a sinner and you need your sins forgiven. So that's why God sent His child to die for the sins of the world so that all who put their faith in Him and receive that by faith And that is something that continues in our Christian life because after we get saved, we can start by faith but want to continue or complete it by works or intellectual inquiry or investigation, but we have to be brought back to the fact that we need to have the faith of a child and just believe what God says about Jesus and then watch what Jesus does in your life. So, I just wanted to say a few things to you today about kids. I think they're very important. I'm I'm thankful for you all here. I think we do a great job with VBS, with Word of Life, with our Sunday morning children's ministries. But it's not just those things. It needs to be the disposition of our hearts towards children. I'll say this. I'll say one more thing, and it's very sad. It's very, very sad because the world has the opposite attitude towards children. And then, unfortunately, there's a lot of abuse of children. It's sad. And because of that, nowadays, anyone that's friendly towards a child and maybe just wants to minister to them is suspect because of the evil predators in the world. It's sick. But I also think Satan could try to be discouraging us too much Don't be too loving to the kids. Someone might think you're evil. I think we should use wisdom and discernment, obviously. Don't be dumb. Don't be the only person at a playground hanging out with kids. I'll slap you in the face with love. And just say, are you thinking? I'm not trying to contradict what I just said. I just, I wanted to lighten the mood, to be honest. Um, But... The point, you understand the point I'm trying to make. Don't take me too literally. The point I'm trying to make is, of course, use wisdom and be cautious. But don't get too stiff just because there's a lot of evil people that have harmed kids. Let's not let that scare us from ministering to kids wisely, carefully, accountably, but the kids need our ministry. Does that make sense? All right, let me pray, and then uh, after I pray, the men are going to come up for communion. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that exists in here. And I just pray that you give us a heart for kids. And I pray for VBS this week, Lord. Let the children come. And give us wisdom and give us discernment as we minister to them. And I pray for every child that enters these doors that they will be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. 
And I also pray for every adult, every parent, that they will be ministered to by the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the men are going to come up and we'll take communion together. You can turn to 1 Corinthians 11 if you want to uh, follow along with the reading on the Lord's Supper. Now first, um, I uh, want to say this, uh, looking at uh, verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, there was a, a specific, let me remind you again, and maybe you haven't heard this from me before. There was obviously a specific context in those days and how that was happening. They were having feasts around the Lord's Supper, and people were getting drunk, and people were getting selfish, and just their hearts were not right in it. The application today is this. Number one, in order to partake of the Lord's Supper here, you have to be born again. What that means is that you've turned from sin, and you've trusted Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And if you've done that, we welcome you to the Lord's table. We don't, you know, you, in some churches you have, um, this is just an interesting fact, open communion and closed communion. Now, some churches guard the Lord's table very, very um, fastidiously, and they want to know who you are if you're going to partake. We don't take that approach, but we urge you, if you are not born again, please do not partake. If you want to talk to me more about what being born again is, I would love to. But it means that you have trusted Jesus Christ, and he is your only hope of salvation. And the Holy Spirit has come in, and he's given you a new heart. So if you are born again, you are welcome to partake of the Lord's table. If you are not, I pray you would use this time to seriously consider coming to Jesus Christ, because every Lord's uh, every time we do the Lord's Supper, every Lord's Supper is an evangelistic call to come to faith in Christ. I would also encourage you as believers, those of you that are born again and believers, and even though you have all your wonderful, won, wonderfully, uh, how am I saying? even though you, all your sins are wonderfully forgiven, use this time to confess, confess any known or unrepentant sin. Um, maybe there's some people you got to get right with. Okay, let's make that right with the Lord and let's make that others. So let's just use this time to um, examine ourselves before the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Brother Ed to pray for the bread which represents our Lord's broken body for us. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the price you paid, the work you did, the brokenness you accepted on our behalf. You completed the work at the cross. Your body was broken 
so that we might have life. Thank you, Lord, that as Pastor said, we can come boldly. Your word said that we can come boldly to the throne. It reminds me of a time when we had missionaries from Calvary, Jerry and Jan Harpool, and he was a mission there in Zimbabwe. And he told us the story of one of the sons that was in his class. And he was a son of the king who no women could ever come into his presence other than his wife without him uh, allowing it. And really no women did, he said. But because Jerry's wife and Jerry knew the son, the king had an audience with Jan and Jerry. Because he knew the son, he could come and see the father. Thank you, Lord, that we know the son. And you allow us to partake, to come into your presence. We can't even realize the privilege and the, the love you have for us, Lord, to be able to come into your presence. Lord Jesus, thank you for your broken body that represents this bread broken for us. In Jesus' name. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As you, as you eat this bread, remember, his body was broken, torn apart, so we could be forgiven. So remember and thank him for that. It's just the most beautiful I. I don't, I just don't know of any other faith in the world that has something so beautiful. God dying for sinners. God becoming a man. I mean, let us never let that become um, routine or taken for granted. And it does. It has for me. We always have to come back to how fascinating and amazing this is. Shed his blood. So on that note, verse 25, in the same manner... He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. When you think of all the commands in Scripture, all the Old Testament laws, that he shed his blood to forgive us completely. It's an amazing thing. I'm going to ask Brother Chuck to pray for the cup.
Lord, I thank you for this privilege to honor you and what you asked us to do so long ago, that, that forget me not in the Bible, will do this in remembrance of me. It's an awesome privilege, Lord. We're grateful for what you did on that cross for all of us. And the forgiveness of sins and how you broke in your body, Lord, you gave more than anybody else could ever give. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. This little drop represents what Jesus did to cleanse you of all your sins. Let's partake and thank him. Father, thank you for this joyous day. We ask you for your grace and your mercy and joy to be with us. We ask you to bless this uh, wonderful week of VBS. Keep us all safe. Keep our loved ones safe. And I pray we honor Jesus in all we do. In his name, amen. All right, have a wonderful week. And uh, I hope you're going to see some kids. The kids are going to stick around to see the jungle. If you want to see too, you're, you're more than welcome. Have a good day. Worship the Lord.